So good morning, thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Don Coleman. I work for Chariot Solutions and I'm here today to talk to you about the Internet of Things. You know, WTF IoT or IoT for the win? Is it the worst or the best? So starting out, I don't really like the term Internet of Things, but it's the term that's caught on, so I've kind of given up and started using it. Uh, for a while I was hoping the term connected devices would catch on. Um, but IoT is much more than connected devices. Uh, sure, inexpensive microcontrollers have, have enabled us to internet enable all the things, but IoT has expanded to include not just these devices, but the firmware that runs on them, the edge computing, servers or cloud computing, data collection, machine learning, security, privacy. It's starting to encompass all sorts of things. So there's a whole series of systems that enable us to get data from a sensor to a microcontroller up to the server and then through some magic eventually down to your phone. And then that return path where you can do something on your phone and send something back. There's a lot of complex machinery behind all that. So IoT is the idea that we can take any device and add the internet to it and make it better. And then that device is called a smart device. Whether or not connecting it to the internet is a good idea. So this is a tweet from CES this year where internet enabled fridges, which were kind of a dumb idea to start with in my opinion, um, but you know, we gotta build these things. So this fridge, if you leave it op the door open, it's going to send you a text message. So I'm here, I left my fridge open, I get a text message. You know, what good is that? So my favorite response to this from a great Twitter account, edited to make it PG-13 here, you know, why the heck doesn't it just close the door itself? That would be a much better IoT thing. Rather than texting me, you know, let's actuate a motor, let's shut it, you don't even need the internet for that. Um, so, you know, th th there's gonna be a lot of good things and a lot of bad things, but that's okay. So, IoT isn't really new. It was, the term is supposedly coined in 1999 by Kevin Aston. Uh, while he was working at Procter & Gamble. He did it in a uh, presentation. But the I IoT has been around for a lot longer than that. Um, you know, if you look back in 1996, General Motors introduced OnStar into their 1997 model Cadillacs. And you know, this wasn't exactly the internet of things, but it's kind of leading us there. If you're in a crash in your Cadillac, the airbags go off. There's a sensor that notifies basically an um, analog cell phone that's kind of duct taped to the CAN bus network and it makes a call to the OnStar network operator to say, hey, are you okay, do you need a tow truck, an ambulance, whatever. Um, and so this is pretty awesome. It's low tech, it's, you know, we hook a cell phone to a, a network and we just make things work. And this is, you know, it, now you're like, yeah, whatever. But this is a time, you know, not everyone had cell phones. A lot of people had cell phones, but it's not like everyone had a device in their pocket then. Um, but, you know, if we think back, we're gonna give you a little, history here, um, I was thinking, I'm like, well, how did I get into doing devices? I've been doing devices for a while. I'm primarily thinking of myself as a software developer. I've been developing software for a long time, but I've been messing with hardware for a long time because it's kind of cool and shiny and uh, you can do cool stuff with it. I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. So I reached out to a friend of mine, Tom Igo, who um, he's one of the people that helped get me into doing hardware and building these things. And I sent him an email, I was like, yo, Tom, you know, what happened with the IoT before it was IoT and why didn't connected devices catch on like we thought it was going to? And uh, so Tom teaches at the ITP program at NYU. I'm an adjunct there. And uh, ITP is a funny name. It stands for um, Interactive Telecommunications Program, which when it was formed in 1979 was a good name. Now it's more about you know building devices and stuff. It's part of the Tisch School of the Arts, which is really weird because we're teaching technology to art students. But that's one of the great things. You take these master's students and they're coming in and they more have an art philosophy on things and we're doing technology. So they don't have preconceived notions about what you can and can't build. So we kind of arm them with the, tech, you know, the ideas and the technology to build all this stuff. But anyway, Tom first pointed back to that Kevin Aston quote. From two, there was a 2009 article where Kevin wrote and said, hey, you know, I, I coined this term. But he reminded me that uh, Kevin's vision of IoT is, you know, it's basically a surveillance state or totalitarian, you know, all these devices sending data and keeping tabs on everyone. It's really, that's not the IoT future that I want to see. You know, the Internet is a communication tool. It would be much better if IoT enabled us 
to have better human interaction through network systems. And I realize, you know, that's a little bit, you know, unrealistic, but we can still try, strive towards good things like that. So even before um, Kevin did that, if we look back to Xerox Park in the late 80s, um, there was a guy, Mark Weiser, and he was doing something he called Com Technology, which is a horrible name. They later, recall, re re later renamed that Ubiquitous Computing. So there's this really interesting article with funny pictures. It's like 1991, Scientific American. And it really talks through that. So a lot of the paths kind of lead back. And so we had a big, long conversation. I don't want to bore you with all the details. But a few kind of interesting things came out. So Dan O'Sullivan is one of the guys who uh, runs ITP uh, right now. But he was a student there back in the early 90s. Before he was a student there, he was an intern at Apple under Joy Mountford. Um, and then so, you know, he came, he was doing uh, stuff at IoT, and he basically developed a physical computing class to help artists do technology. Um, that later turned into a, um, a book that he wrote with Tom. And so physical computing has kind of shaped a lot of my thinking from, through my time at IoT, at IT, ITP. So at the same time Dan was doing that work, um, Neil Gershford at the Center of Bits and Atoms at MIT, and uh, Hiroshi Ishii at the Center for Tangible Media were doing very similar things. So it's like all these things were happening at the same time. And this is just one particular thread I know about this. But you talk to enough people, there's going to be lots and lots of stories like this. Um, there was also a lot of stuff at the Royal College of Art in London. Uh, Gillian Cranford Smith had a, um, she was putting together a similar sort of program. And she had a couple of people who also interned under Joy Mountford. So that kind of, I don't know a lot about Joy, but her kind of her name kept coming up in these stories. So that in early influence of UI design and thinking at Apple kind of led into some of these IoT things. And then um, Gillian Cranford Smith founded a uh, program Ivera where Massimo Banzi started to teach physical computing there, and then like Tom and Massimo are some of the people that formed the Arduino group. So there's a lot of these kind of connections that they all come together with. Uh, physical computing, then moving into connected devices, ubiquitous computing, and IoT. Um, so there's a whole ton of stuff I skipped, and there's probably stuff I got wrong on that, but at least this stuff goes way back. It's not just something that happened uh, in the Gartner hype cycle when it came up in 2011, and everyone in the world wrote articles about it. So, you know, getting back to today, you know, we can connect anything to the internet. And why now or in the past few years has this really taken off and this didn't happen in 2003 as much? So I think there's really three reasons for this. Inexpensive microcontrollers, inexpensive networking, and the cloud. So let's start off with inexpensive microcontrollers. Um, you know, there's really cheap microprocessors or MCUs. We've gotten to the point that they're so cheap, they're disposable. You can put them in anything. Um, electronic devices have been moving. You know, back in like the 80s, you'd see things that said solid state on them. You know, so they all had smaller computers. But these things are getting smaller and cheaper every day. And um, they've gotten to the point where the tools are a lot better. These things used to be very hard to write firmware for and program. Um, at a lot of conferences, I'll te teach workshops where you take software developers or junior high kids or people that don't know anything about software, and you put them in a room, you give them some hardware and some wires. They're able to wire up some stuff, connect it to the internet, and start sending data in a two and a half hour workshop, which is pretty mind blowing that that's possible to do today. So, uh, Alistair Allen calls this in these inexpensive microcontrollers capable computing, computing that's good enough and cheap enough. I like to call it disposable computing. These MCUs are so cheap that you can have an idea, you put one in a project, you build the project, and then if it doesn't go anywhere, you just throw it on a shelf. And it's cheap enough that you don't have to go back in and scavenge the microcontroller out of that to use in the next new project. Even more so than those cheap microcontrollers, because the cheap microcontrollers have been around for a long time. The inexpensive networking is even better. So it used to be you would take a board and then you'd have to get a separate micro, um, separate networking controller if you're trying to do Ethernet with the stuff. And they had no RAM and the Ethernet stack would take up almost all of the memory and you could barely write your code. Now you can buy um, these chips that have Wi-Fi built in. Uh, there's some you can get for $3. There's a new one that um, 
the Seed Studio selling and it's I think a dollar ninety if you're buying one of them and it has Wi-Fi built into it, which is absolutely amazing to me. So you can run your code and the uh, network stack right on there. So uh, Bluetooth, low energy, and Wi-Fi are in almost everything. Uh, if you go look through your many people's homes, you got a lot of Z-Wave and XB and um, Zigbee kind of devices running there. Cellular radios are becoming more and more prevalent with machine-to-machine -machine stuff. So um, it used to be, you know, uh, my phone is kind of expensive when I'm paying the bill, but with Hologram and there's other providers too, you can get these machine-to-machine -machine plans for a dollar a month. They'll give you enough data to run an IoT device. So that means you can then put cellular radios and all this stuff. And then there's a whole new class of uh, low power wide area network things like Sigfox, uh, LTEM, and LoRaWAN. And these promise to send data over multi kilometer distances on battery powered devices very inexpensively. So it used to be that hardware and tooling were kind of something that was difficult. Now we have a lot of that stuff. Um, now the expense in building these things is like from the engineering and the software and the thought process around building the devices. So the third factor is the cloud. And you know, this has made computing and storage uh, readily accessible and inexpensive. Um, it used to take huge budgets and many, many months to order servers and set up data centers and you'd be waiting forever for these things. You know, today I can provision as many servers and databases as I need by going to AWS or Azure or GCP. I can use my credit card, but often I don't even need that. It's running in a free tier. I spin these things up, I do what I need to do. That can become a production thing if it's good, or if I'm done with it, you just throw it away. And uh, sometimes I fail to appreciate how awesome that is, that you can get that stuff on demand. And so on top of that, it's not just raw compute power I can rent. Um, there's a whole bunch of services I can get that make building applications easier. So there's, you know, uh, processes for, for provisioning devices, queues for collecting data, services for managing keys, uh, on-demand databases, so I don't even have to set up EC2 anymore, I can just provision a, a, a database, products for visualizing the data. All these things that used to be expensive and very time consuming are now accessible, fairly easy to use, and much, much lower cost. So now shifting gears a little bit, one of the funny things about IoT is you know, I read a lot of marketing and stuff about IoT and people are pushing this, but at Cherry Solutions, no one asks for an IoT project. They just don't do it. Um, it's a good term, it's an abstraction, um, marketers love it. So people have a problem that they want to solve and they go about solving it with technology, with sensors, microcontrollers, wireless networking, servers, apps, um, things that run on your phone. So as technologists, people look at this and they say, hey, what's the common thread across all this? All these different projects, hey, we're gonna call this IoT. But for the most part, when we talk to clients, they don't ask for IoT. They come to us because they have a problem they wanna solve. So IoT describes a common thread across 75 different industries. So for instance, we talked to a company and they wanted to buy, provide remote access to the systems controlling underground storage tanks at service stations. So these are old systems that work great, but they were built in the 80s and 90s. I realize this picture is a little bit older, but it's much more interesting than a picture of the Circle K from 1989. Um, so here's one of those controllers, you know, which we bought and had sitting in our office. You can order them off eBay. They're great, this big honking machine. Um, so if there's a problem at the gas station, an alarm would go off and something would print out on that receipt paper and it's kind of blaring this thing. And the guy working there is supposed to walk in the back and hit the cancel button, rip off that receipt tape, and then fax it to the home office. This is super high tech. Um, the reason they have to fax it to the home office, the home office cares about this because the landowner is responsible if there's any problems, if there's a fuel spill or leak or anything like that. The, uh, the, the landowner is responsible, not the guy who's like selling me gum and uh, some gas. Um, so oftentimes these alarms aren't anything that needs immediate attention, but the choice can sometimes be, do we ignore the alarm and have a violation, or do we roll a truck and send a tech out there, and then we've spent a bunch of money for something that didn't need to happen. So both of those are potentially pretty expensive. So our client was building this IoT piece of hardware. Here's one of the earlier versions. 
And on one side, we had a serial connection, an RS-232 connection, so really old school, and we'd plug into that Vita root controller. And then in this board, we had a cellular modem, so we could have connectivity, and we had a battery. So we could send our data from that controller up to the cloud. And so the firmware on this device would sit there and it would run these commands. Basically, you'd have to run these serial commands. We'd send a bunch of junk in, and you'd get these pieces back, and then we'd send them up to the server. We'd aggregate all this stuff, and that way we would be notified when an alarm happened. And then when an alarm happened, sometimes the step was, well, hey, we want to run this other report and run these, other, and these things to see if it happens. So we were able to automate that. The server was able to collect this, see that, and then forward that to a person in an operations center who was managing a lot of these stations. Um, so this allowed technicians to be dispatched only when there was a real problem to be solved. And uh, we could have gone with Wi-Fi, but getting Wi-Fi at a whole bunch of different um, service stations throughout the country tends to be a problem. So that's why we went with cellular and got really good coverage over that and managed to keep the amount of data so that it was still reasonable for the service. And so the station owners got compliance. And one of the nice things is they got a better overall view of all of their systems. You know, they could see that inventory and all these other things. That wasn't necessarily one of the main goals. The main goal at the beginning was compliance, but we got all these other benefits out of it. So that's one instance of the Internet of Things. Uh, we also had someone come to us. There was a medical device supplier, and they had all these kind of, you know, cheap, you know, made in China knockoff medical devices. Um, but they're like, hey, we want to make this better for our clients. We sell all these devices. They're like, we want to make an app so that they can connect their blood pressure monitor, their temperature sensors, their glucose monitors, all these things into it. And they're like, we kind of know how to build apps, but we don't know how to do that part. Can you help us out? So we, you know, we work with them and we built Bluetooth interfaces to do all this stuff. We built uh, the sample apps for iOS and Android, and we gave them a framework to build everything on. So we got the device connectivity into the app, and then the client went and built the rest of the stuff from there. So this is definitely IoT, but the client definitely didn't mention IoT at all. So then we worked with another small manufacturer that builds water methanol injection pump controllers for race cars. It's kind of a mouthful. But basically, water and methanol are mixed and injected into the combustion chamber with the air and gasoline. So this increases the compression of the engine, giving you a lot more power. So it's kind of like thinking nitrous oxide, but uh, it works really good for turbocharged engines. It's something that's been used in airplanes for a long, long time. Uh, but it's relatively recent that people are doing it again in cars. So this is pretty cool. You know, they have this controller, they're really working to map the flows, and they have some complex software where when you're in the garage, you're, comp you're mapping this controller and you're doing everything. But then when they get out on the racetrack, they really want to see what's the performance kind of real time, making sure that it's happening right. So they had an intern build a Android app and they had cobbled together a Bluetooth controller. And so we went RS-45 to Bluetooth and sent the data. And they had kind of a working system, but then we really sat down and we worked through a lot of the performance things. We rewrote the firmware on the Bluetooth controller so that we could get the data rates we needed. And we built an iOS app to go with their Android app and kind of fix some of the Android issues. Um, and so that's kind of a very niche app, but it was very cool to be able to get that and provide that on-demand information for the drivers that needed it. So uh, home automation and home security is a lot of the stuff that we do at uh, Cherry Solutions. We had a few customers doing that. Um, and so that's a really good area of IoT. If you go into one of our project rooms now, there's more switches and light bulbs and things that you can, uh, and circuit boards everywhere. Um, and so it's basically, we're still doing software development, but there's a lot of hardware thrown in now. So there's so many projects. Those are just some of the things we've done. We've also done voice interfaces for hands-free operation for surgeons doing uh, for, for medical teams. Uh, we've helped start us build electronic bumper stickers, done some, worked on some personal safety wearables. Uh, we've made some um, self-service beer taps that run via NFC, and uh, a, a lot of really good things. But the common thing among all those is they all came to us with, hey, we want to solve this problem, not necessarily we want to do IoT. So there are many companies building IoT projects. And this goes, there's a lot of headline catching projects that I'll put under my stupid projects category, like internet enabled egg trays. This is a smart salt shaker that has a lot of features, but it actually doesn't shake the salt. It puts the salt in that little drawer on the bottom and you gotta take it out and dump it on your food. <laughs> I'm like, really? Okay. 
um, internet-enabled juice machines. You know, and the thing is, I used to be like, oh, this is really dumb, people shouldn't do this, but we're gonna have to go out and build questionable projects and products. We're gonna have to make mistakes and kind of figure out where these things fit. Where does the internet add value and where doesn't it add value? And so it's all part of the process. For every kind of dumb project, there are excellent ones across many industries. They don't always catch the headlines. So, you know, there's large agriculture companies like John Deere working to internet enable and automate farm equipment. So right now the farmers will still drive around the fields, but eventually they, you know, you're gonna send your combine out there and it's just gonna do what it needs to do. There's much smaller startups like uh, Terralek in New York City. They're building these soil sensors. The sensors are about this tall. And so you gotta auger a hole and you pound them into the ground. And uh, you put you know, a certain number of these per acre and they're measuring the water level and the fertilizer level at three different layers in the soil. And so they're looking at, over time, collecting data so that the farmers can get better yields using less fertilizer or put the right amounts of nutrients down where they need to go. And so they run on LoRaWAN. They set up a LoRaWAN network across the farm. Usually they're fairly flat areas so they can drop a gateway in. And then since LoRaWAN has a fairly good coverage, they can get a lot of coverage by, you know, a uh, gateway up on a silo. Um, Almost every new car rolling off the assembly line now is, you know, a computer with wheels, some more than others. Um, IoT is basically affecting us in almost every industry. Um, so there's a lot of common threads through all this, but once again, that common thread is called the Internet of Things. So if we look back and we're like, you know, what is the Internet of Things, essentially? I kind of narrow it down to these two things that need to happen. You get a sensor and you're reading some values from it. You gotta get that, you know, the microcontroller is reading the sensor. It's sending it over some network up to a server somewhere. And then sometimes we wanna send a command that we're gonna actuate something. We're gonna tell it to take a reading. We're gonna flip a switch. We're gonna adjust a level of something. So then we go from the server through that network, to the microcontroller, and then we actuate something. And with those two basic building blocks, we can build lots and lots of these things. Now sometimes if we have a sensor we're reading once an hour, we may have a camera where we got you know, streams and streams of data going, but it's all that same type of idea. But in order to do this, we need to connect the device to the network. So the first thing we need is we need to kind of pick a transport. And what, we're gonna pick this based on uh, you know, what we need our device to do, what the surrounding areas are. Uh, sometimes this could be a serial connection or it could be an ethernet connection, but typically this is gonna be a wireless connection. And so the hardware, we with the hardware we choose will determine how we connect. So Wi-Fi, Bluetooth Classic, Bluetooth Low Energy, there are a lot of choices, there are a lot of things. Um, you know, sometimes it's configuration, or they're, they're, all of these have trade-offs. Um, then we have Zigbee, XB, Z-Wave, Thread, uh, custom like 433 megahertz radios, a lot of stuff that's in home automation we see. And then cellular is great for places where we wanna go and we wanna drop in. Um, things that are running without a network there. One of the problems with cellular though is it typically uses a lot of batteries. So you need to have, you need to be plugged into power. Um, and then we got things like Sigfox, LoRa, and LTEM. I'll get to them in a minute. So we have our transport, but then we also need a protocol. So uh, the protocol, you know, a lot of times we'll be running HTTPS, MQTTS, things like that. Um, other times, um, Co-app is another big thing. Sometimes there's a good separation between the protocols and the transport. Sometimes there's not. Like if you're doing something like Bluetooth Low Energy, GAP and GAT are going to be what you use because that's just kind of what works with the network. If you're doing LoRa, you're probably doing LoRaWAN as your protocol. And, but sometimes you're doing low-level TCP, UDP. The point is there's tons to choose from. And so really depending on what you need for your project, it's like you can go out there and find what you need and easily assemble and test um, to make sure that you have that. So about six or seven years ago, we came up with a project. We were starting to get into IoT, and we're like, hey, let's see what we can do to like, build some monitoring on the network, uh, around the office and just collect some data. And so we built these sensors uh, that used an Arduino and an XB radio, which is a mesh network, and we put all this stuff on there. And at the time, it was pretty cool. I look back at that, I'm like, ooh, kind of cringe words in now, but that's okay. Um, and at the time, this was 25 bucks for an Arduino, 15 bucks for a Shield, $30 for an XB, so that's about $70. We had some sensors in. It's about $100 to build that, which seemed like it was pretty good. If I look at that today, you can do that for a lot cheaper based on a lot of these other things. 
Um, one of the things that really changed the way of thinking around this was the ESP8266, ESPRIF systems releases, I think in early 2014, and there was like no English documentation. There was an AT command set so you could get on the network. So a lot of people would take these and hook it up to a microcontroller via serial, and they would get things on the, uh, on, on the network. And then people figured out that, hey, why just use this as a network radio? We can actually run our code on there because it's a microcontroller. So they figured out how to run the code and the microcontroller on there for, at the time, it was like a $3 sensor. Um, it has GPIO or general purpose input output so you could read values, you could send stuff. And uh, so it's pretty cool. You can still buy those, but they stink. They don't fit in breadboards. They're a real pain. There's uh, something called Node MCU. I think I bought them on Amazon last time for about six bucks a piece. That's essentially a better version of that with a USB connector and all these things. And so these stuff, these uh, hardware is getting better and still very, very cheap. And there's tons of other, uh, there's tons of other things. You know, I wouldn't necessarily use this in a real project, but there are, if you crack open some of these IoT devices, there's this ESP8266 or ESP32, the newer version inside there. <coughs> So when it comes to you know, building real things for our clients, one of the products we use is from Particle. Particle is a startup, they've been around for a while, but they make hardware. They have Wi-Fi, mesh, and cellular hardware. They provide pretty good APIs. They connect um, via co-app, but they have a nice API on top of it. So very easily you can get your device set up and you can be sending data to the internet. They also have the way they do their firmware, you can push firmware updates to this. So if we deploy something with Particle, we're running, um, and we need to push a new version, we can do that through the cloud, and it makes management of a lot of that easier. Um, I think this board here is a $19 board if you're buying one, so it's still very, very, um, very affordable with the Wi-Fi built right now. Some of the newer, more exciting things that I think are kind of, the, that I've been working on more lately that I like, there's, um, these are the LP, WAN, low power, wide area network protocols. Um, Sigfox, LoRaWAN, LTEM, NB-IoT. The LTEM and NB-IoT are based on the cellular, uh, cell phone companies are doing those. They're gonna have those standards come out. It's basically gonna work like cellular, but be low enough power that you can do things that are gonna be able to run on battery. Um, Sigfox is run by a French company, and that's once again centrally controlled. They're gonna, um, they have good coverage in Europe, not so good in Philadelphia, um, but they say they're gonna expand and have more. But same kind of idea, you have this low power radio that you can send small amounts of data over large distances. So LoRa or LoRaWAN is the one that I like the most. Um, the exciting thing about LoRaWAN is that you don't need a network provider to do this. You can set up your own LoRaWAN network if you want. There are companies like uh, Machine Q or Comcast that are working to uh, network enable Philadelphia and other cities. And there's a group called the Things Network that is working to set up kind of community-based LoRaWAN networks. But if you have a project that needs to send data over fairly long distances at fairly low data rates, it can be a real good choice. The other thing is the server technologies are maturing. Uh, AWS Core IoT is one of those things. It is basically an MQTT interface, which is a way you can send data from a device to the network. One of the nice things that I like about AWS Core IoT is they try to force you to do the right thing. You can't just connect your device using a username and password. They make you use a client certificate to authenticate with the cloud to verify who you are. They make sure you run over MQTTS, which is a secure version of MQTT. Um, and uh, it, you know, it sounds like it's a pain to have to do things over a secure channel, but it's actually not too bad. Um, there's these, uh, a lot of new devices are coming with these crypto chips built in. It's tough to, you know, show, I'm like showing a, a website for a chip, but this little chip is cool. It's about a 73 cent chip. It has a crypto engine in there, so it'll let us generate a private key that is on the device. It's locked inside there so we can access it to generate a certificate signing request or put a certificate on there, but it stops people from dumping the firmware and pulling certificates out of the firmware. Um, so seeing more things come like this in commercial hardware is really excellent. There's uh, so many excellent network microcontrollers, it's, it's an exciting time to be building this stuff. 
So, you know, where are we going next? Some people talk about, you know, artificial intelligence, self-aware systems. I think it's a while before we get to artificial general intelligence. But in the meantime, people are going to be building a lot of these devices that have the ability to collect lots of data, telemetry, metrics, location, health information, et cetera. You know, some of the scarier ones are collecting the facial expressions. And, but, you know, it makes storing and analyzing all this data a lot easier and cheaper. Um, so we can do really positive things with that, or we can do really not so positive things with it. Um, so one of the good positive examples lately is Apple with their health stuff and they had the heart monitor and there have been some stories about, about how they were able to look at that health data and kind of notify and save some lives with that. So that's pretty cool. There's also some things that don't work out quite as well. There's a fitness tracking company that's like, hey, we have all this data, we're gonna release this so data scientists can look at that. And then people started doing all these things with it and then finding you know, people exercising in these weird places in the middle of nowhere, which ended up revealing the, uh, you know, these secret army bases and uh, are, are from not just the US, but other countries too. And so that was not necessarily an intentional misuse of the data, but it is kind of a misuse of the data. You know, there've been multiple cases of smart TVs and other devices spying on people. And, you know, Facebook, as we know, often gets in trouble for doing the wrong thing with data again and again and again. Um, by the way, Facebook does have this device you can get that has microphones and cameras. You can put it in your house and uh, $99 on sale. No thank you. Um, so one thing I think with data that's very important that companies don't do well at all is to get the user's buy-in with what you want to do. Lots of times there's a lot of legal boilerplate end user license agreement crap like this. And you have no idea what they're going to do. And so I think uh, if you're working with someone and you're taking their data, if you're not clear what you're doing with the data, it moves a lot closer towards surveillance than IoT. So finding that right balance is going to be important, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of nightmare stories before uh, that gets better. So another interesting thing is the idea of mal data or malicious data. So as we have these systems that are collecting data and kind of assuming that the sensors are doing the right thing, doing the machine learning and finding out what's going on. What happens if we can teach machines to lie? And not to lie blatantly, just to lie a little bit to skew data and do different things. Um, so my friend Alistair, Aldisar Allen was talking about this a few years ago as strictly a theoretical thing. It's still kind of theoretical, but this is from the Washington Post last month about this group in uh, Israel that basically came up, they were, wanted to expose or bring attention to all these flaws in these medical devices. So they wrote this malware that you could add cancerous things into a CT scan or MRI scan before the radius, radiologist got it. And in their testing, it was pretty convincing. And then the other thing they have, which is even more insidious, is that you could remove those things so that it looked like the person didn't have cancer and didn't get treatment. So that's kind of some scary stuff, and it makes us think a little bit more about oh, security really is pretty important and these big, old, expensive machines that have been around for a long time. So one of the other things that happened recently is, um, and this is a little contrived also because the group that did this was from Tencent who is building their own autonomous driving things. It's the Keen Security Group. But they figured out they could put three stickers on the road that would make Tesla Autopilot think there was a lane change and got the car to veer into oncoming traffic. And so that's... Uh, Pretty interesting there too. We're feeding this malicious data that people aren't necessarily gonna see, but that the machines see. By the way, they said they fixed that problem, so. Um, so, you know, another area in general, I'm sorry, I had to reuse this. This is my best dumpster fire picture. Um, another area in general, the IoT that's often overlooked is this security area. You know, they say the S in IoT stands for security. There is none. Um, the problem is that security needs to be a consideration from the beginning. Often it's an afterthought. And when you do an afterthought, you run into project, products like tea kettles that reveal your network credentials to everybody. Um, if you go to the Hardware Hacking Village at DEF CON or follow InfoSec people on Twitter, it's really scary and you really see a lot of things you're like, this is totally a dumpster fire. Um, there are many security nightmares in IoT. Um, like the Mariah botnet where people were able to log in because of default credentials, take over those and do a distributed denial of service attack. Um, oh, I talked about this one already. 
So now we're gonna talk about something in particular, and it kind of sucks to pick on a company, but we're gonna do it anyway. Um, I don't feel too bad picking on the company because these guys had so many problems that uh, it, it was comical if it wasn't so sad. So Taplock came out last year. They did an Indiegogo, I guess a little while before that, they raised $300,000 to build the smart lock. And it actually seems pretty cool. There's a thumbprint sensor on the front. You can hit it to open it up. You can control it via Wi-Fi. I can grant you access to come unlock the locker for a day or something. This looks really good. Um, so there's a guy on YouTube, Jerry Rig Everything, that bought one of these, and he cut it in half, and he was doing all this stuff. And then he figured out that, hey, the back of this just unscrews. So he bought another lock, put a GoPro mount on, unscrewed the back, disassembled it, and took it apart. And so it had physical problems like that. Um, there's a guy, Andrew Tierney, uh, he's known as Cyber Gibbons on uh, Twitter. He works for Pentest Partners. He does a lot of great work. Uh, he also noticed he used a poor choice of material, and like bolt cutters could cut through it very, very easily. And then he started kicking around with the lock, and he noticed that it was using HTTP, not HTTPS, to communicate with the server. And he noticed that every time he unlocked it, the same code was sent back and forth. It didn't change at all. Nothing happened. Um, and if you granted someone else permission to unlock the lock, that same code went to them also. So if I give you permission to unlock my lock for an hour, that code will actually unlock the lock forever. And they're relying on the app to destroy that token and not me taking the token and putting it somewhere. Um, so they have a great write-up on uh, what they did here. And uh, the other comical thing is that that token, not only were they reusing that token, Andrew figured out that it was based on the MAC address. So you basically do an MD5 sum with the MAC address, which is the hardware address of the lock, and you could unlock it. So now you could unlock any of these locks. Now getting the MAC address, is that hard to do? No, because this is Bluetooth Low Energy, and one of the things Bluetooth Low Energy does is it advertises its MAC address out for anyone to listen to, so you can connect to it. So it's like, hey, here's my MAC address, and then you can take this, uh, run it through his Python script, and it just worked. Um, so I had him send me the Python script. I'm like, hey, I want to try this. I do a lot of Bluetooth stuff, and I wrote an uh, Android app that unlocked it, and that was cool. I'm like, let's do this on iOS. I'm like, oh wait, on iOS, it does Bluetooth Low Energy, but Apple hides the MAC address from you as a, um, as a, as a developer when you're doing iOS stuff. So we decompiled the uh, Android app and we started looking in there. It turns out there's another command you can tell the lock, hey, give me your MAC address over Bluetooth. So we were able to say, give me your MAC address, got the MAC address, ran that. So now we had iOS and Android apps that can unlock it. And I was thinking, I'm like, Hey, wait a minute, we have web Bluetooth now. So if you have a Mac running Chrome or an Android device running Chrome, we could write a web page that would undo this lock. So with this web page, um, it's untap.me, you can actually you hit a button on the lock to do Bluetooth stuff. It scans and finds it, and it runs the commands and unlocks the lock. Any lock, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> so that was really good. And then there was a, a bunch of kerfluffle about this, and tap like, heck, hey, we're going to start, you know, we're going to have a... Um, uh, updates and so I updated the firmware on one of my locks and it's like it broke my thing I'm like oh crap that stinks they actually fixed it but then this other guy's like hey there's this you know earlier firmware with this hard-coded key so on a whim I'm like let me try that hard-coded key on the new firmware and so the new firmware the hard-coded key opened all the locks I was like really this is like absolutely insane um, so that that update made it less secure at the same time, there was another guy that didn't have a lock, but he's like, let me look at the server side here. So he talked to Andrew Tierney and said, hey, can I use your account? And he started digging into the account. And uh, it basically came down to is once you were logged in with an account, you could access all the information about any lock. You could share any lock you wanted permanently to any other account. And you could access the user's account information by putting something in. So not only could you access your own account information, you could access any user's account information. Um, so, I mean, if there was a mistake you could make with IoT, I think these guys made all of those. Which is really a shame, because it's kind of cool hardware. Um, you know, and I'm picking on Taplock because all this stuff was out in the open. You can go back and you can read the articles about it and see it on Twitter. But they're definitely not the exception. There's a lot of stuff out there where people are building stuff under pressure, or startups with kind of cool ideas and want to get this stuff out of there. And they're more thinking about what can we deliver to the consumer, not how can we deliver that securely. Um, 
So Bruce Chenier is a security researcher and he does a lot of good stuff. He's written a ton of books. Um, he's written this book with a nice clickbait title, Click Here to Kill Everybody. Um, he also has a uh, talk that he did at Google that's on YouTube where he's talking kind of about this book. And one of his points is, you know, with a computer when there's a virus or malware or some other problem, people can lose data, they can lose documents, they can lose money. But now that we're connecting everything to the internet, you know, you have the potential to be able to kill people by writing things bad or having someone hack your system or stuff like that. Um, and when everything is a computer, security is more important, but it's even more difficult. It's much easier to attack these systems and poke holes in them and tear them down than to build them the right way. So, you know, it's fun to be able to go in and trash them. But then when you think about the other side is how am I going to defend, defend against these and what can I do? That becomes a very, very hard problem, which is a very important problem to solve. You know, by the way, uh, Bruce calls this stuff Internet Plus rather than the Internet of Things, and I thought that was a pretty good term. But that's a great, uh, great talk on YouTube, and uh, the book is pretty good, too. Um, there's another guy, uh, Mike Montero, and he's a designer, and he tries to go out and, you know, troll people on Twitter and stuff like that. But this is a new book he has, Ruined by Design. And he actually wrote this book for designers, um, but I think a lot of the stuff really applies to people designing software systems and... Uh, this kind of work we do with software architecture and stuff like that. He talks a lot about these software systems and he picks on Facebook a lot. Like, hey, how did all this stuff get out there? How did this stuff happen? And he's like, someone must have seen it along the way. But a lot of people think it's someone else's problems or maybe they're not empowered enough to do it. Or, and so his philosophy is a lot around, you know, do the right thing, make sure we're building systems that are good. Um, so I thought there were a lot of good lessons to learn even though I'm nowhere near a designer as you can tell from my slides. Um, So book challenges you to think about kind of the impact of systems and the stuff, uh, stuff you're building for the world. So I gotta ch cheat here and go to my notes for a second. So as a technologist and a uh, user, I think IoT is really amazing. It's cool technology that works like magic. I come home, garage doors open, other doors unlock, lights turn on. Um, I can control music and other things by talking to a computer in my house. Uh, remote sensors help my HVAC system run better um, and more efficiently. Cars send fault codes to the mechanic so I don't have to worry about, you know, what's going on. Um, hardware devices and, are cheap and plentiful, so, you know, you can build anything. Um, there, you know, there are some dark sides. There are real concerns about privacy and security, which hopefully they can be addressed if people are thinking about them more and the impact of the systems that we're building on people. Um, so, you know, we've covered a lot of stuff today, or I've covered a lot of stuff today. I appreciate you guys listening. Um, and it's easier than ever to add internet to physically connected devices. The question is, can we add internet to any device? Yes. The better question is, should we? Maybe. So, you know, can we add the internet to add value and functionality and ensure that we do this uh, with security and data privacy? It's possible, it's a lot more difficult. So. That concludes my talk. I'll have some time for questions. Uh, we can answer questions here, and also I'm gonna be, be available for the rest of the conference. I'm happy to come up, have conversations with you, uh, all of you about this stuff or anything else. So thank you very much. So now we got uh, time for some questions. I'm gonna try to switch over to this. Uh, Hang on, I gotta mirror my screen if I'm gonna read this stuff. How does this work? Do people shout off things or am I gonna have to read them off of this? Uh... All right, hang on, I gotta get the uh, screen mirroring so I can see what's going on here. All right, I can't see that at all. I'll try to do this here. I'd much rather prefer people do it with a microphone. So. Uh, IoT systems exploited by denial of service attacks. Are there any organizations providing? So, yeah, are there any organizations that um, 
you know, do auditing. There's groups like pen test partners and a whole bunch of security firms that will do auditing of your devices. Um, you know, there's sometimes people will come out and claim that a device is unhackable. So some of these people on the internet will just do it for free. But really, if you're going to want to do this, you need to hire a firm to go in and do the security on all your devices. Um, so what are some technologies or career paths you'd recommend for someone interested in related to IoT jobs? That's a good question. I don't know if there's necessarily a clear path. One of the biggest things I think is that IoT is software, at least the stuff that uh, we do. The things that we're doing at Chariot, we're doing a lot of stuff from the device up. So our stuff overlaps with the systems we're building in the cloud anyway. Um, so I think just really learning how to do software and build software is the, the way to go there. The next major innovation in IoT, I have no idea. I hate uh, predicting the future, so I'm not going to go on record saying that. Uh, yeah, there will be a copy of the slide deck. Um, if you go to don.github.io, I will post the slides later today. All right, does anyone else have questions that aren't through our wonderful uh, impersonal interface there? <laughs> yes? So I have I heard of the cryptocurrency IOTA. Yes, I have, and uh, the, I guess the idea behind it is you were gonna use cryptocurrency to do transactions, and based on what I know about blockchain and based on what I know about the computing power of a uh, microcontroller, I think the idea is pretty insane. But, um, so I'm not pursuing anything with that, but I know a lot of people are kind of working on things like that. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming out. Enjoy the rest of the conference, and uh, I'm around, find me if you wanna talk at all.